Hey all, Grim here. Welcome to episode 2 of my Dark Souls modding tutorial series. Before we get started, some updates on where these videos are going. Firstly, thank you for all of your responses to the series so far. I know Dark Souls modding is a bit of a niche activity, but it's great to see there's interest out there, and hopefully these videos help expand that interest. Secondly, I'm modifying my plan for the series to make these videos a little more contained. That means tutorials will be shorter, more frequent, more focused, and happy to pull examples from any area in the game. Other topics like area-by-area -area design discussions and looks behind the scenes of Daughters of Ash will get their own video series. I haven't decided what order I'm going to cover these topics in once more of the modding basics are out of the way, so if you have any thoughts or preferences, let me know in the comments and I can put it to a vote on Patreon. Today's modding topic is player characters. Last time, we looked at the three basic ingredients for every character that appears in a map entry. The character model, the character ID field, and the AI ID field. But there's a very special type of character that appears frequently in Dark Souls, and that's what the game calls a player character. These are characters who use character model 0, written as C0000. This is also the model used by you, the player, hence the name. You'll find these characters at the top of the character entry list in each map, and they include familiar faces like Solaire, Ziegmeier, and Patches, as well as invaders like Maneater Mildred and Kirk, Knight of Thorns. The terminology here is a little confusing, because we typically call these characters NPCs, or non-player characters, and FromSoft does this as well in some places. Of course, even that term is a bit vague, because technically every character is an NPC, down to the lowliest Blighttown Mosquito. We might think about calling characters like Solaire human characters, because they're based on a very human-looking character model, but that gets confusing when we recall that human has a special meaning in Dark Souls that distinguishes, say, Human Oscar from Hollow Oscar in the Undead Asylum. And some characters who are apparently human, like Anastasia and Andre, actually have their own unique models. So I'll be calling these characters player characters, because their character is based on the player model. Player characters require a fourth ingredient in their character map entry, a player param entry ID. These entries contain all the extra information that defines an instance of character model 0, including armor, weapons, rings, consumables, gestures, stats, covenant, and facial appearance. All of these fields are fairly self-explanatory and mostly point to entries in other param tables, which we'll investigate more in a future video. Let's try making some basic edits to this table by playing a bit of Fashion Souls with the Crestfallen Warrior in Filing Shrine. First, we need to find his map entry. If you have the prepared die edition, you can use Catalash's Map Studio program for this, like I showed you in the last video. But note that Model 0 currently doesn't render properly in the 3D viewer. You'll need to click through the list of C0 characters until the Crestfallen Warrior's position is selected. Or, you can scroll through the character list in the Dark Souls Remastered Debug menu until his capsule lights up. Turns out he's C018. By the way, while we're here looking at the debug menu, note that the white circle next to each entry means that character's draw groups or draw parent are currently active. This doesn't necessarily mean the character is visible, because they might be dead or disabled by an event script, like most of the characters are here in Filing Shrine right now. But it does mean they'll be rendered from where we're currently standing if the character is both alive and enabled. Going back into Soulstruct, we can rename the Crestfallen Warriors map entry so we don't have to go through this again. Just like last time, I prefer to leave the model part of the name intact and change the part after the underscore. Now let's follow the link to his player param entry, which will usually be the same as or very similar to his character and AI entries. In fact, note that every player character you'll come across in the game has an ID in the 6000 range. Increments of 10 or more refer to different characters, and increments of 1 refer to different versions of the same character. If we scroll back up to player entry 6000, which is Solaire, we can see Solaire has a few different player entry versions ending in 0, 2, 3, and 4. We can paste these names into Google Translate to find out that they correspond to Solaire in Undead Berg, Anor Londo, Demon Ruins, and Demon Ruins after he's possessed by the Sunlight Maggot. If we click between them, we can see that the only differences between these entries are upgrades to his stats and equipment upgrade levels. The last two digits of each weapon and armor piece indicate the upgrade level of that armor or weapon. His armor grows from 2 in Undead Berg to 10 in Anor Londo and Demon Ruins. His Sword and Shield upgrade from 3 in Undead Berg to 12 in Anor Londo and 15 in Demon Ruins, along the normal upgrade path, of course. His Sunlight Talisman has no upgrades available. Version 6004 also changes his head armor from his usual helm to the Sunlight Maggot. 
It also changes his face ID, which is unusual for a player character. By clicking the link and inspecting the face param entries, we can see that the only difference between face 6000 and face 6001 is this change from a straight ponytail hairstyle, Soler's normal hair, to a wild ponytail for the Sunlight Maggot version. A neat little detail, considering we can't really see his head anyway. Back to Crestfallen Warrior, who has player entry 6270. He also has a second version, 6271, which is the hollow version you encounter in New London Ruins after Frampt wakes up. Interestingly, the name of this hollow entry refers to Castle 1, the internal name for Undead Berg, suggesting he was originally going to be fought there. Let's try stripping Crestfallen Warrior of all his armor and changing his right hand weapon to a wooden shield. Removing the armor is easy, we just set all the armor fields to minus one. But identifying the weapon ID of the wooden shield is a little bit trickier. And yes, shields are considered weapons in FromSoft games, as is anything else you can equip to your left or right hand, like a catalyst or talisman. All of the weapon param entry names are in Japanese, but because the English names that actually appear in game have the same IDs, Soulstruct will look them up for you from the text tab and display them here in curly brackets. We can make these English names official by going to the Tools menu in Soulstruct, the Param submenu, and then choosing to rename all items and equipment from the game text. This renames all weapon, armor, ring, good, and spell param entries that have a name in the game's text data. Note that not every param entry has a corresponding text entry, because some of these param entries are unused. They stick out like a sore thumb now that we've translated all the real ones. Also remember that these param entry names have no effect in game, so this changes all upside for modders who can't read Japanese. The link previews to these entries visible from other tables, like the weapon fields in the player entry here, will now be in English as well. At this point, we could scroll through the entire weapons table looking for the wooden shield, but a much more efficient way is to go to the text tab, choose the weapon names list, and search for wooden in the box up here. This search function is only available for text data right now, but the ID we find is the same as the weapon param entry we want, so we can plug that straight into Crestfallen Warrior. We'll keep the wooden shield unupgraded for now. One more change we'll make before we get back to the game is to player entry 9000. This is the information used to initialize us, the player, whenever we load the game in debug mode. As you've seen me using in my footage, the default equipment for the debug player is a bit random and annoyingly heavy. It's probably just the last setup that the debuggers at FromSoft happened to test. Let's change our right-handed weapon to the Uchi Katana, plus 15 naturally, and change our armor set to the plus 10 black leather set, minus the helm. We can search for the IDs for the black leather set in the armor names list, just like we can do for weapons. I'll get rid of most of the other equipment and spells as well, and boost my starting soul count just a tad. Unfortunately, whenever we make a change to the params, we'll need to fully restart the game to actually see that change. This is because the game only loads params once at startup. The same is true for text data. This gets annoying very quickly, so I recommend making param and text changes in batches if possible, and testing out several modifications at once. The debug version of the game is also much faster to load, which helps out a lot for this. When we jump back into File and Shrine, we can see the beginnings of a fantastic new mod. Okay, maybe not that fantastic. His AI is still treating that right hand wooden shield as a longsword, and there's no convincing him otherwise without editing his battle script, which we're a fair way away from. Next, let's look at the Talk ID field that appears in his map entry. This references a script in the talk files of that map that control the character's interactive behavior. These talk scripts define detailed state machines, with the character changing between dozens of different states, like showing the initial talk prompt, saying a particular set of dialogue, giving the player a response choice, displaying a shop menu, and more. These scripts are very complex because they have to handle every possible scenario that could occur while you're interacting with the character. We'll look at them much later. Most player characters will have a talk ID, of course, because these characters are usually friendly and up for a conversation, but in principle, talk scripts can be used with any character. We can test this out by changing Crestfallen Warrior's talk ID to zero, which is the default, and giving that talk script to our friend Boris the Pinwheel from the last video, who is still hanging around in the file and graveyard. Since this is just a map edit, we only need to reload the map and not restart the entire game. I'll also make myself invisible and silent to enemies in the debug menu, so we can get close enough to him. Well, what do we have here? You must be a new arrival. Let me guess, fate of the undead, right? Well, you're not the first, but there's no salvation. Well, what do we have here? Now, Zirat, you have some nerve. I 
may be crestfallen, but I'm not defenseless, you rascal! You will soon regret this! As you can see, the game kind of handles this change off the bat, but it gets very confused when we kill Boris. It plays his dying words because his HP is at zero, but because the game's event scripts believe the real Crestfallen Warrior is still alive and well, he's never properly certified as being deceased. There's a notorious glitch very similar to this that sometimes happens after you kill Crossbreed Priscilla, the only character in the game with a talk ID who is also a boss. That's everything for today, folks. If you liked the video, let me know, and subscribe if you want to see what's coming next. As always, I want to give an extra special thank you to all my supporters on Patreon for making this series possible. All your support for my mods and videos is greatly appreciated. Join me next time when I show you how to back up your game files and manage mod installations with Soulstruct. Until then, stay human.